Did you notice in the two phases? Did you notice in the report that was done by the consultant? Yeah, there were the consultant. Oh, the report by the consultant says that height is overstated. You can actually too high can be a problem. Height. The July 16th, 2014 council meeting. First, first order. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, general public comments. Uh, I'd like to make. Um, if you're here to uh, talk about uh, cell phone towers, that's next on the agenda. So, I'd ask that anybody that had uh, public comments other than the cell phone towers, please step up to the mic. Three minutes. Name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Tim Downs. I live at 44 Jones Creek Drive. I have lived here all my life and my family has been here since the 1600s. I have also served on this town council. I have great reverence for both my family history and the council. I presently serve on the Shellfish Committee. About a month or so ago, I was made aware of another committee member calling another clam digger a nigger. I approached Sheldon Blaze and told him that this was totally inappropriate, unacceptable, and an embarrassment to the town and the committee. He said he would not do it again. Well, he did it again. I hope the town council takes appropriate action and re removes this individual from the committee. If this is not done, I fear the message that it will send to our school children about what is acceptable. In the town charter, under Article 2, Section 204, Enumeration of Powers, appoint and remove the town manager, assessor, town attorney, and appoint and remove members of the Board of Assessment Review, the Board of Appeals, the Planning Board, and all statutory and advisory boards. I hope you will take that action and remove this individual from the Shellfish Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Karen DeAndre, uh, Eagles Nest Drive, and I apologize ahead of time. I am going to speak to the cell tower issue, but I, because I have to leave to go to a work-related meeting. Um, so I am here to urge the council to either A, vote this down tonight, which would be uh, what I would prefer, that the cell phone towers stay in the um, industrial zones, or B, uh, take it back to the ordinance committee and the planning board to take a longer look at it about uh, to see if these could, in fact, be cited in better places. I have two concerns. One is, my major concern is uh, property values. And from what I've been reading, um, property values decline uh, 10 to 20 percent when these things are cited near homes. Um, I work very, very hard to own a home in Scarborough and pay my taxes here. And uh, while I would like less taxes, <laughs> I don't want to lose the, prop, uh, the value in my home for an industrial use. And I see this as an industrial use. Um, I also have concerns about the health uh, uh, problems that have been associated with these. Um, there, uh, the studies, again, I've looked at, and I think probably the council has seen by now, certainly link cancers, cl cancer clusters to uh, cell towers. Um, they, this is the same kinds of data that we saw with cigarettes back in the 60s and 70s when they first started realizing that um, cigarettes caused cancer. Um, even doctors were smoking and saying, cigarettes are fine. So I think we need to have, make sure that we take precaution when it comes to our children and our families in Scarborough. And I hope that you will, uh, again, either vote this down completely tonight or take the opportunity to send it back um, to get a better look at how we can recite these. Other towns have banned them in neighborhoods. And so there are certainly workarounds for um, where these towers can go so that they're not impacting homes and neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Next, anyone else? Anyone else? 
Okay. Public com uh, general public comments closed. And next would be minutes of June 18th, 2014, regular meeting. Over Is approval. there any errors or omissions? Did we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Items to be signed, treasurer's warrants. I have those. I'll be signing those during the meeting. And Order number 1453 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed changes to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to create a transmission tower overlay district and to update the performance standards there, too. And we'll have um, Dan Bacon make a um, short presentation before we go to um, comments from the public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I bring up a uh, app real quick? Um, this has been a, an initiative the staff has been working with the ordinance committee on uh, for a number of months, and this is the effort been to to make some improvements um, to the town's to our wireless service in the community where currently coverage is lacking. Um, the last time the town has updated um, the allowance for transmission towers and wireless service was back in the, the mid to late 90s, and there's a lot more dependency and um, desire for uh, service throughout the committee. Um, and so that's why the committee uh, initiated this action some months ago. Uh, to help us with the technical aspects of this effort, we did engage an independent uh, consultant to work on behalf of the Ordinance Committee uh, to conduct a, a coverage analysis and assessment to, to more precisely understand where coverage is lacking in the, in the town. Uh, this map uh, is from that assessment, and uh, to help understand what it's illustrating um, in green is where uh, currently there's um, there's good in-building uh, wireless service. Uh, the orange-brownish areas uh, per the consultant's mapping are um, in-vehicle uh, wireless coverage, but not in-building. And then the white areas of the community of the map are where there's not reliable um, uh, in-vehicle or in-building um, cell or wireless coverage. In addition to um, understanding where existing coverage is, is good or poor. Uh, the consultant also is tasked to suggest some locations that may be appropriate for new tower or wireless service installations that would ex effectively uh, serve the poor coverage areas of town. As he did this, um, the ordinance committee asked him to look at town-owned properties, uh, part of that work um, to to see if installations would be possible or appropriate on some town-owned properties. Um, town-owned properties were viewed as uh, good sites in that they'd enable uh, the town and town council to have more decision-making authority. Uh, I think it's probably the two microphones okay. competing. Um, as well as uh, enabling if the town council decided to um, provide for a lease to uh, a tower uh, in wireless providers, um, some town revenue. So this work by the IDK consultants, uh, I did identify uh, 11, 11 potential sites um, that really would effectively um, provide strong or, or high quality in building coverage throughout the community. So really fill those poor coverage areas. Um, and those 11 sites aren't proposed sites. They're not something that's proposed by the council this evening, but rather just perspective or potential sites that would um, serve those various areas of town. Um, that would be a separate process as to decide whether to move forward on any of those 11 sites. So following the consultant's assessment, this coverage analysis, and also the uh, potential 11 sites that would uh, provide great coverage, uh, cell coverage in the community, the ordinance committee then started to look at um, 
zoning um, to better allow for where wireless facilities could go into in town to serve these areas. Um, and that effort resulted in uh, the zoning amendment proposal that's in your packages that was reviewed at first reading. It's also reviewed by the planning board four weeks ago at their public hearing. And those zoning amendments really focus on um, five or six areas or key changes. One of those areas is adding um, an allowance for transmission towers or wireless antennas um, within the town's rural zones. So the RF and the RFM um, are the rural zones in town and also the VR4 and Crossroads districts. And the, the reason for that proposal is um, those zones match up with this map um, quite well in terms of filling the, the poor coverage areas. The, the white um, and some of the brown areas on this map, which are the, uh, the poor coverage areas of the community, also are largely made up of the RF districts and the uh, village residential four and crossroads districts, which are around the Scarborough Downs property. This map here is the town zoning map, and I know it's hard to see from your seats, but uh, the zones that have the red cross hatching are uh, what's proposed to uh, be adjusted to allow for transmission towers, to allow for wireless um, antennas. Another uh, proposed change uh, that's related is an allowance to al provide for transmission towers that would be 150 feet tall as opposed to the current limit of 100 feet. Uh, the intention of that increase in height is to enable the co-location of different wireless providers' antennas on the same tower. Uh, the intent there is to enable fewer towers town-wide uh, because there could be co-location of multiple providers on the same tower. Um, currently, at 100 feet, there would be the potential for fewer providers on the same tower, and in order to provide uh, coverage for different providers, then that would likely result in multiple towers within the same area. Um, related to that, there's a proposed change to the performance standards for transmission towers um, to require when a tower goes in that it be built and installed to accommodate multiple uh, wireless providers on the same tower so that one um, provider isn't putting in a tower and then inhibiting or preventing another uh, provider to locate on that tower. Beyond those proposed adjustments, uh, there's also an additional performance standard uh, which would establish a removal requirement uh, for any abandoned towers. This is looking out you know, some, uh, some distance in the future, um, but right now the town doesn't have provision that if a tower is no longer used or is abandoned, um, that it be removed. And Ordinance Committee felt that that would be an important thing to add in that the instance of technology changing or a tower no longer being necessary, that's not just a um, infrastructure that's on our horizon that's not functioning for some benefit. And one of the last adjustments um, related to trying to minimize the number of a towers is um, an, an update to uh, the town's allowance for telecommunication facilities, and that's basically a wireless antenna mounted to a building. Right now, only town buildings and uh, places of worship can have um, these installations. And so uh, the proposed adjustment is to allow for more of these installations, say on taller commercial buildings or other structures that um, could provide wireless service on a structure and perhaps prevent the need to, to build additional towers in certain parts of town. And as a, a last item of note, uh, the performance standards and the zoning adjustments uh, proposed to update the, the local board review process and uh, the planning board's review criteria um, of new installations. The other final comment I would make um, is since your first reading, I mentioned the planning board did have a public hearing 
um, and they also conducted their advisory opinion. You should have uh, received some minutes in your packages uh, from their deliberations. Uh, they did, uh, the majority of the board did have some um, questions and concerns with sort of the broadness of where transmission towers would be allowed under these amendments. Um, so they did ask that the ordinance committee perhaps take some more time in um, considering some of their comments before moving forward with second meeting. So I just wanted to forward you their, uh, their comments uh, since your first reading. So with that presentation, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, I don't think um, we need to have questions. Um, we'll go right to the... Did you want to leave that up there, Dan? Because... Um, because uh, we want to take comments from the public, sure. public hearing, so. All right, who would like, whoever would like to speak to the issue uh, can step up the podium, name, and address, please. Three minutes. My name's Karen Tangway. I live at 40 Tenny Lane. You may think that we all just believe that cell phone towers are ugly. I have to admit that I've never seen one in better homes and gardens. I don't believe that any realtor has had a client ask him to find him a home near a cell phone tower. These towers do negatively impact home values. But there is even more to it than that. At worst, we can say that cell phone towers represent health issues to those who live near them. These risks could be life-threatening. At best, we can say that the jury is still out on the risks of living near a cell phone tower. More studies are needed and will be done in the future before all the facts are clear. If you decide to go with the unlikely option that no new information is going to emerge in years to come regarding the safety of living near these towers, and that there's nothing unsafe about them, then you're taking a chance with the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of Scarborough residents. And if later on it is known that residents have been dangerously exposed to something that will infect or shorten their lives, what do you plan to say to us all and to the children in our neighborhoods? It seems unthinkable to me that you could decide that all information is definitive today that living near a cell phone tower is safe. Such a decision would weigh more toward what would presently benefit the town rather than what you know for certain could or couldn't harm us. We elect you and trust you to look out for our interests and well-being first and foremost. There is not enough scientific evidence out there at present to convince reasonable people that living near a cell phone tower carries no risks. The American Cancer Society has acknowledged that conclusive studies regarding cancer risk have not been carried out. I would encourage you to take a, to take a better safe than sorry approach to this. And speaking for myself as a seven-year cancer survivor, I don't want my chances to be even possibly compromised by having a cell phone tower not within miles of me, but within yards of where I live on Tenney Lane. We all know that cell phone towers are here to stay and that they have to be somewhere. But do we really want them right over the heads of families in the Settlers Green neighborhood or surrounding neighborhoods? Do we really want them by a park that has a playground where preschoolers play? is used six months out of the year for youth sports and is less than a mile from the Pleasant Hill School. I am strongly opposed to changing needed zoning laws in our town in order to place cell phone towers in neighborhoods. They belong in industrial zones as far away from residential areas as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Donald Day. I live at 32 Fairway Drive. Um, for you people that may want to know, that is off of Highland Avenue, right behind the Highland Avenue Greenhouse. I abut uh, right up to the back of Highland Avenue Greenhouse. 
I also own a cottage at uh, 20 Morning Street in Higgins Beach. And I'm here this evening to talk about cell phone service. Uh, and I can't remember it's 15 or 20 years uh, cell phones came into use, but for that length of time, I have been trying to get good cell phone service at my house. And one of the reasons I am concerned is for safety. My safety, my family's safety. Um, I do not advise or recommend using the cell phone by driving while driving, but over the 20 years I have used it going down the Black Point Road through the salt marshes. I drop calls down there, so I know there's no ser good service there. On Highland Avenue, I drop calls. In my house, I drop calls. And um, so what happens on an icy night and I slide off into the salt marsh and can't get out of my car, I'd like to be able to use my cell phone or my kids or my wife. Um, so safety is one of the main reasons. Home value. Um, if your home does not have good cell phone service, your value is going to plummet. If I was to look for another house today and, the, and they said there was no cell phone service at the house I was looking at, it's worth zero to me. I wouldn't even consider it. And I know there's millions of others uh, feeling the same. Um, I work for a company who has, I have an office in South Maine. I have a phone and computer there. But I'm on the road salesman. So I do a lot of my work at home. I prepare myself in the morning. I take phone calls from customers on my cell phone. Uh, and it's always, can you hear me? Can you hear me? affected by that. Just last week, um, on the TV news, 41% of the homes in the United States have only cell phone service. They do not have landline service, and it's growing exponentially. We're going away from the landline. We need cell phone service. The younger generation only has cell phones. My 30-ish kids only have cell phones, not landlines in their house. And, and the last thing I want to say, I have a report, I guess it's different, from the American Cancer Society. A totally, fully noted report on cell phone towers. I use American Cancer Society as the, the um, epitome of knowing of cancer. They have this report addresses specifically cell towers only goes through it. There is no evidence whatsoever, whatsoever, that um, cell phone towers uh, uh, have anything to do with cancer. Coming from the American Cancer Society, they go through and explain why cell phone waves are different from other type waves, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I don't know where some of this other information is coming from, but here it is. Um, so. And I, uh, I guess I'm going to end right there, but I really want cell phone service. And I please help my safety, help my family, and help the values of my properties. Thank you. Can I just leave that in case someone... Despite what it sounds like, I don't think we have a helicopter landing on the <laughs> roof. Um, Interestingly enough, cell phones will affect the coverage in here, so anyone that has one, I suspect many of you do, make sure they're turned off, and we'll try to take care of this audio problem. My name is Julie Tupper. I live at 165 Spurwink Road. Um, I went to the Scarborough Town website, and it says, Scarborough, a premier community for families, businesses, and a destination for outdoors enthusiasts. The images on the website seem to have been carefully chosen to reflect Scarborough's most beautiful treasures, the landscape. Marshes, farms, wandering estuaries, beaches, parks, ocean vistas, trails, rocky coasts, etc. 
There were no images of such beauty interrupted with huge cell towers, but rather void of most utilities. The images tell a story. There is something so calming and gorgeous about this slice of heaven that we residents are proud of and need to continue protecting. Scarborough has done such a fabulous job attracting and retaining residents who are passionate about their surroundings. The land trust efforts are something to truly be proud of. Preserving large tracts of land for all to enjoy is vital to the health of our lands and community. I moved to Scarborough three years ago from South Portland. I am humbled by the beauty and, the rejo and rejoice my happiness to all visitors and residents. I am truly lucky to live here. When I read the Scarborough Leader's June 13th edition, I was first horrified with the article about changing the zoning to allow huge cell towers to blanket residential neighborhoods, either on private or town-owned property. Then I became extremely saddened, deflated, and quite honestly ashamed that our representatives would allow such an extreme violation to our town's beauty and property values. I question why those who are in position to protect our residents' land and wildlife are now not thoroughly looking at all implications that this irreversible charge would imply. Number one, sight lines com compromised by industrial towers. I don't want to look across the Spurwink River and see an unnatural spike of technology interrupting the beauty. Number two, property values quickly diminish. I don't want my neighbor to be lured by money and one day have the option to permit a cell tower next to or across the street from my house. I purchase my home strategically, away from industrial zones and within a natural setting. I purchased in good faith, knowing that zoning was in place to afford me my criteria. Peace of mind and the value of my property would be negatively affected by this change. That is intolerable unfair and inexcusable. Number three, well-known documented health implications, particularly in areas immediately surrounding the tower. There is credible evidence mounting that there are significant adverse health concerns. We cannot put our heads in the sand, however inconvenient the truth may be. The adverse health effects documented at levels below FCC guidelines include altered white, white blood cells in school children, childhood leukemia, insomnia, impaired motor function, reaction time and memory, headaches, dizziness, fatigue, and weakness. The IDK communications report. There are two sites pr proposed to be placed by schools and one by a recreational park. This is shameful. There is one site proposed on the edge of marsh, beach, and waterways. This too is horrible. There are four sites proposed on private land. Residents in these areas are up in arms that their neighbors would have the approval to have a tower planted in their neighborhood. It seems all of this was spurred due to a few people with concerns about cell coverage. Surely we can slow this process down and come up with reasonable solutions that preserve our great town while affording a small percentage of residents with better connection. One simple and inexpensive option that a friend of mine down in Higgins Beach has... Ma'am, four, four minutes now. Okay. Three. Um, is a, a booster device within one's own home. He had sketchy service, and now it's, he doesn't have a problem. I request that you not approve this zoning change. Keep all cell towers in industrial zones only. That includes keeping them off stealth sites, such as paying churches to hide them in steeples and compensating municipal buildings to put them on rooftops. Keep Scarborough safe and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Please try to keep it three minutes. Hello, my name is Alicia Emmerich. I reside at 3 Haystack Circle in Scarborough, which is right off of Colthards Farms Road. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Mr. Bacon. I was wondering how much uh, the town of Scarborough has paid IDK Consulting for this report. I, I, I'm sorry. You, you just you, you can't ask questions right now. You just comment to the council. What do you feel? Well, do we? Does the council know yep. how much we've spent? Yes. We so, need at a later time. Pardon? This is the public comments. We're right. listening to your comments. Okay. We, we're not fielding questions. All right. Okay, All right. that's you. fine. I'll move on. Um, I printed out one of my um, the parcel report from the town um, 
and it clearly says my home that I purchased specifically for its location is zoned as RF, Rural Residential Farming. I can assure you that neither myself or any of my neighbors purchased rural residential farming to look at an industrial or commercial application in our backyard. And I, I'm furious about the prospect of it. Um, uh, Mr. Bacon uh, happened to mention the wonderful new bankruptcy performance standard that was going to be entered in. Um, this will not work. The town that I used to live in um, uh, was the home to Exide Battery Factory, and anyone who's ever dealt with a business who's gone bankrupt, all the company does is declare bankruptcy, and we're the taxpayers are going to be the ones responsible for taking down their cell phone tower. That battery factory contaminated the soil, and they've been waiting 30 years for a government bailout to come in and clean up the soil, and it's a vacant building for 30 years. So that's a huge, huge implication that a performance standard will not take care of. Um, secondly, I wanted to mention the town's current performance standard clearly reads, in order to minimize adverse visual effects of transmission towers through careful design, siting, and vegetative screening, and to avoid potential damage to adjacent properties from tower failure and falling ice, through proper engineering and careful siting of tower structures. Transmission towers are subject to the following standards. No transmission tower shall exceed 100 feet as height in height. Mr. Bacon and his team are trying to raise that to 150 feet. Um, this would be including any attached receiving and transmitting um, devices. It also mentions that if certain towers are not subject to lighting standards, that they have to be a certain color. So nothing is Mr. Bacon mentioned about lighting, and that's another whole concept. No one wants lighted, especially cell phone towers in their neighborhood. Um, this clearly was an issue when the board drafted this standard in 1995, and the last thing I checked, ICE is still a problem in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Karen Gadboyce. I live at 10 Haystack, which is a connector road between Tenney and Colfide Farms. Um, I have a great concern for the cell phone towers that are going in, and I wondered, with all our industrial property in Scarborough, could we consider locating them there? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. My name is Julius Sombranowitz, and I live in Scarborough on 16 Minuteman Drive. I like good cell coverage. I'm a big fan of it, but I oppose the zoning changes. In my 17 years as an attorney in Maine, in these situations, I found it very helpful to identify exactly what's being proposed and what's exactly being voted on. <clears throat> I've read the six pages, single-spaced, of amendments to the town zoning. To be clear, today's proposal is a huge change for the town of Scarborough. Cities and towns all over the U.S. are successfully rejecting cell towers in locations where they don't want them. In fact, many cities and towns are retooling their zoning ordinance to prevent cell towers from being built, not changing zoning to allow them to blanket a region. This issue is not unique. However, the way the town is approaching the issue is very unique. Here there is no cell tower application. If there was, the Scarborough residents would have known about it beforehand, and we all would have been able to have a pointed discussion about that specific tower. That's how the process is supposed to work, on a case-by-case -case basis. Importantly, there is no law requiring Scarborough to create and pass new ordinances loosening zoning laws for the cell companies. The current zoning is legal. Accordingly, it is unclear why the town is attempting to push through amendments to loosen the existing zoning laws to allow more cell towers in more zones. Understanding the law here is important. The attorneys for the cell companies follow a nationwide template. They target cities and towns for new towers. It's their business. When there's resistance, they either find new locations or they use the threat of FCC law to try and enact a change. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's true. Due to some careful lobbying at the federal level, RF emissions can't be the stated reason for denying a cell tower. However, we don't even have a tower application before us, so this doesn't apply. Further, 
Scarborough always has the legal right to reject a cell tower for lowering property values, for aesthetic reasons, and for any other reason, reason, reasonable reason, excuse me. Bottom line, the law does not state that Scarborough needs to change its zoning. In fact, it states the opposite. On its website, the FCC provides guidance for state and local governments concerning cell towers. In its first Q&A, it states, quote, do local zoning authorities have any authority to deny a request for a tower siting? Question mark. Answer, yes. The Telecommunications Acts of 1996 specifically leaves in place the authority that the local zoning authorities have over the placement of personal wireless f facilities, end quote. So you, you just can't deny our tower solely based on RF emissions. That's it. So for the moment, Scarborough residents have the right to decide where to towers are located, not the cell companies. Like other cities and towns, rather than making wholesale zoning changes that will tie the town's hands, I respectfully request that we improve cell reception in ways other than wholesale zoning changes. I hope that Scarborough isn't the town that makes the news for unnecessarily giving its residents' rights away to the cell companies, and I encourage you to vote no on the proposal. Thank you. Alan Russell, 210 Lane. Um, I've always hated following lawyers, um, <laughs> it's, although it makes a lot of sense and that was fantastic. Um, I'm more of a common sense person, and if you start reading this back and you, and, you, and you look at what the facts are, I can't see the actual problem being what we're trying to solve for. I like to solve for problems as much as the next person. It was brought up once earlier today, and I've installed them myself. At a, at a home level, repeaters are very easy to, to uh, install, and the cost of them come down dramatically. So at a home level, if you want to get rid of your, your home phone service, you can do that effectively with these devices today. Uh, and they're very affordable, all right? So, and in fact, it'll provide better service than, than you might be able to get otherwise, right? Um, but moreover, let's talk about property taxes. Um, I, too, bought here because school systems, area, people, beautiful neighborhood, love it. Um, I don't think that the town is prepared to reduce our taxes by, after they install a cell tower. Uh, I can tell you that taxes uh, won't go down. They never do. I can also tell you that property values will go down, um, just as if you put a huge windmill next to my house, right? It happens. It's what happens. And people wouldn't buy there. It's just, a, it's just a reality. People will buy in areas where cell service is weak because there's a solution. You can put something in your home and fix it, right? And they're not saying, I now need a 150-foot tower next to my home to make this work, right? There are individual solutions to fix these things that does not require a town installing huge towers in residential areas. I would, I would suggest that you vote this down as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Wayne Tangway. Uh, I live at the end of Tanny Lane. Uh, I like to talk about property values. Uh, there have been studies done, and I looked at six or seven of them. Uh, most of them were done in two, 2000, 2008, 2009. They were done in Glendale, California, uh, Windsor Hill, California, New York, and there are some of them that were done all over the world. And every one that I read said that, uh, and these are specifically, specifically related to, to cell phone towers. Every one that I read, and I did print one out in case y'all y'all want to see it. Uh, they said that property values go down from 2 to 20 percent based on how close the home is to the cell tower. That's 2 to 20 percent. And a lot of the homes in the development I, I live in are, uh, they, they are they're, they're, they're quite substantial in cost. Uh, from where I am, down at the end, end of the lane, end in Tenney Lane, and for the one proposed at the the park at the end of Tenley Lane, I, I, I'm, I'm probably going to take a huge hit on the value of my home and land. Uh, I don't want that. I got down there and we bought down there so that we, we could uh, look, look, look at the land, the wildlife, and I'm just not, I'm not prepared to take that kind of a hit. And all of these studies that I read, there wasn't one of them that said 
it increases the value of the homes. Um, I'm, I'm also concerned about the concentrated electromagnetic waves, and there are pros and cons. Everybody says there are, there are health there are health problems with it, and there are some say that there are not. Uh, the fact is that there are probably just as many pros and cons, but we need to do more work and more studies need, need, need to be done. I just think that the town has taken an awful chance by allowing these cell, cell, cell towers to, to, to be built within the RF zone. And I hopefully, and I really hope that you folks will vote this down, either that or send it back down for more work because we don't want this in, in our area. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> no, just one time. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Leslie Gaber. I live at 22 Colthard Farms Road. I just wanted to say briefly that I am in opposition to these cell phone towers, mainly for health reasons. Once someone's health is destroyed, you can't really ever make it up to them. They can't get it back. It's a residential area that I live in, and children all over the place, young children, we don't know what the effects will be, and I certainly don't want to take any chances with that. Of course, secondly, I am concerned about property values, as is everyone. And of course, aesthetically, especially going from 100, 100 feet to 150 feet and having multiple um, receptors on there would just be horrible. We live in a beautiful area, and I would like to preserve that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Hi, Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I just, I'm not sure that what the study did. Um, I live down Black Point Road and I'm in the poor to zero coverage. And I use my cell phone almost daily um, during the summer. I turn it off in the winter time, but when I'm my business is because I need my staff to be able to get a hold of me. Um, so yeah, we drop calls, but the coverage is there. So I'm not sure if it goes. And I have Verizon, so I don't know if it's certain carriers don't get it. But what the biggest problem with this approach that the council has done right now is that it's a blanketed approach. Um, eliminating the landline is a choice that one makes. I traveled with my mother, who's 76 years old, and every time we looked for our cell phones, one of them wasn't charged or we couldn't find another one. So I make the recommendation to my mother to keep her landline. Um, she did. <laughs> I'm encouraged by my discussions with some of the town council about, about the intentions of the ordinance. It seems that the planning board and the council um, might agree that it all needs tweaking. Um, we have a very small window to do it. The current proposal as written puts the telecommunications company in the driver's seat, basically letting them tell us where they want to put the towers in the rural zone. Um, just like we didn't want the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to dictate what happens on the Benjamin farm, we don't want the telecommunications company to dictate in our community where the towers should be. Our comprehensive plan, our comprehensive plan should be telling us where in our ordinances, in fact, should guide our planning. In fact, it must, according to state law. We now have data about areas that could use better coverage. I suggest and I recommend that this goes back to, to the drawing board and select some possible sites and then rezone them as industrial commercial because that's where they are and that's where they belong. I also suggest that you require not just encourage co-location because you want a limited number of these towers. You don't want a lot. You want to mandate it if you can. The World Health Organization classifies RF, radio frequency radiation, as a class 2 B carcinogen. What this means is it possibly causes cancer in humans. They have that data already. What they don't have is long-term studies on humans and cumulative effects on humans. But they're starting to come in. It takes years of exposure to get that kind of epidemiological data. and it, and. Frankly, the technology hasn't been around long enough to be definitive. So what that means is we need to take precaution. 
Now, the telecom companies will tell you you cannot cite towers based on adverse health effects. But what they don't tell you is you can cite them according to other laws. You have your comprehensive plan. It says businesses, business uses are separate from residential uses. In fact, you have an obligation to protect the health and safety of the citizens. Um, the plan discusses the maintenance of our rural character and the integrity of neighborhoods, which also includes maintaining property values. Aesthetics is also very important in our comprehensive plan. You are allowed, as a municipality, to disallow a particular use in a particular zone, and you can base that on health and safety. Division of a municipality into districts is exactly what zoning and ordinances is meant for. So a better way for the town to decide how to get coverage is to decide which sites you want and make, a cha and make those changed into industrial and commercial, and then have this discussion again. It's a slippery slope allowing telecommunications companies to tell us where they want to put their towers. It gives them the negotiating power with, the, with one particular property owner versus another. Oh, well, I'll give you $20,000. Well, over here, they're going to take twelve. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So anyway, it's a slippery slope allowing them. So, so I'm, I'm thankful that, I'm hoping that the council will send this back to the ordinance committee and um, consider the comprehensive plan as you go forward. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next. Hi, Ron Bono, Six Tiger Lily Lane. I'd just like to mention in uh, my neighborhood, I have usually one bar of coverage on my cell phone. Occasionally, when I'm lucky, I have two. Um, I'm not complaining. My neighbors don't seem to be complaining. So I don't know where this real emphasis on having additional coverage is such a necessity in the community for the price that we have to pay. From Dan's report, I heard two things. One was, the concern about cell coverage and the other about money. And I think the money refers to cell companies and refers to money the town could possibly obtain from allowing these towers. But it seems to me that we need to have some uh, weight giving t given to health issues, given to vistas across the marsh. It's hard <clears throat> to make a case for having a 140 or 50 foot cell tower in anything other than an industrial zone. And to have a cell tower on town property that has to be, that happens to be located in a, in a residential zone is a poor excuse for saying that's okay because it's town property and we can put it on the sanitary district land that is abutting residential areas and the marsh vistas, or we can put it on a fire station property or on a ball field that's owned by the town. I think we have to go way beyond looking at just money for the town or the cell companies and looking beyond cell coverage when, again, to me, nobody seems to be complaining in my neighborhood, people that I have as friends in Scarborough. Nobody's saying to me, my coverage is terrible. Let's put up 150-foot towers in our backyards to accommodate um, cell companies and to accommodate um, um, the town with additional resources. So thank you. Thank you. Councilors, good evening. My name is Elisa Boxer, and my family and I live at 16 Minuteman Drive in the Pleasant Hill area, where honestly, cell service isn't great. So I appreciate the intention of this ordinance, and I do appreciate all the work that the committee did on the ordinance. Um, would I like terrific coverage if I could get it without risking my family's health and my property values? Absolutely. Am I willing to trade terrific cell coverage for higher cancer rates and lower property values? Absolutely not. And neither are the 100 people who signed this petition over the past few days. I do have it right here, and I can get you a copy. Like people in hundreds of cities and towns across the country where cell towers are being opposed for health reasons, like the International Association of Firefighters uh, that opposes cell towers for health reasons, and like the entire Los Angeles Board of Education <clears throat> that opposes cell towers for health reasons, I've done my homework. I've read the studies. I'm a journalist and I tend to research everything ad nauseum. I know that when a cell tower goes up in a neighborhood, more often than not, um, it does become a sick neighborhood. And when a cell tower goes up um, on or near a school, it becomes a sick school and the teachers and the students do become part of well-documented cancer clusters. 
I also know that there is a law that tries to cut off the voices of entire towns like ours. And that's a law that says when residents speak up and ask you to protect our health, you are essentially shushed. It's the Telecommunications Act, and obviously it was written by wireless industry lobbyists. So no matter how many of your residents ask you to err on the side of protecting our health, um, the wireless industry has created a law that bullies you into silencing any healthy debate about this issue. And that's the bigger battle here for me. Um, that raises a lot of eyebrows, and thankfully there are plenty of people fighting it at the national level. So now back to the local level. So fortunately, in addition to being scientifically linked to breast cancer, prostate cancer, childhood leukemia, and um, a whole host of other cancers, these towers are also incredibly ugly. And because of that, studies show they do lower property values by up to 20%. So cities and towns across the country are rejecting towers for the property value reason, and they're rejecting single towers. This has been pointed out before, but I think it's a really important point. So towns certainly aren't creating new ordinances that would pave the way for an overlapping blanket of towers, like this ordinance would do. Uh, while town boards and councils across the country are finding ways to help their residents oppose towers, uh, it really appears that this ordinance would be helping the wireless industry preemptively tie the hands of the town. And I know that wasn't the intent, um, but it does seem to be the outcome. So I want to read you a quote from a local realtor who she wanted to be here tonight. She couldn't. Um, her name's Elizabeth Bostwick, and she owns Bostwick & Company. So this is from her. Dear counselors, I've been doing real estate in the Cape Elizabeth Scarborough area for more than 26 years, and people do not want to buy a home near a cell tower. This has always been an issue and is becoming increasingly more so. A cell tower in the vicinity of a residential area would negatively impact and has negatively impacted a buyer's interest in a property, the price they'd be willing to pay for that property, and the resale value of that property. I've had many calls from people in an uproar when a tower is being proposed near their residential area. I urge you to do the right thing and strongly oppose any ordinance that allows these towers near where families live and children play. They can be made taller and placed in commercial and industrial zones where they won't cause home buyers to look for another town in which to live. Was that time? Was that three minutes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll wrap it up, sorry. Um, so I do ask for your help in working with us residents to keep these towers in industrial zones, take them on a case-by-case -case basis, do allow for increased height and co-location, um, but definitely keeping them as far away as possible. I think that would help expand coverage without compromising property values. Um, and thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone else? Anyone else? Good evening, members of the council. Uh, my name is Kelly Bowden. I'm an attorney for Verizon Wireless. Um, I wanted to first thank the ordinance committee, the town, the town manager, Dan, and everyone for the what we think is lengthy but fair process um, that has been embarked on to this date that started just about a year ago. Um, we came to Dan, sat down, said you have a pretty restrictive ordinance, seems to be somewhat outdated. There are a lot of locations we would like to start to think about. Um, none had been set in stone. Uh, you can sometimes go to a town, as some members have suggested, that um, with a specific application that's not an allowed use and go through a process that way. Um, in conversations, it was decided to take a look uh, holistically at certain updates that might make sense across the board for the town. And so that was the intent in the beginning of the process, and um, we think it was a good one. Um, we also support and continue to support the hiring of an independent consultant um, who was the advocate for the town on this, not the industry. And what uh, Ivan's report did was identify areas where there's um, exposed need for coverage. It did not you know, pick exact locations where we would submit um, applications even if he thought they were good ideas. So there's new areas where we could potentially file applications. There's provisions in here that give the planning board tools to regulate those applications. We think it's a good ordinance as drafted. Um, it provides for co-location. That's the industry standard. It, we fully expect it. Um, the intent 
is not to proliferate towers everywhere by the companies. It's not actually what ends up happening, and it's not the intended result. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone for the process to this date and hope that we continue forward on a, on a good outcome. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Uh, good evening. My name is Carl Sarek. I live in the Pleasant Hill area. And uh, I just think an industrial area with multiple receivers and taller, taller towers is a good solution. Uh, from what I've heard today, real estate values drop if there's a cell tower present in a neighborhood. Uh, I don't want that. I'm 68 years old. I got an eight year old daughter. I don't want to see her suffer any long term consequences from the radiation to cell phone towers emit. That's, that's all I have to say. I, I appreciate the process of uh, democracy and hashing it out and everything like that. I know it takes a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Pam Fisher, 27 Tenney Lane. Um, I just thought it was interesting. It sounds like this was all kind of initiated by Verizon coming to you guys, not town people coming, complaining about service. So I just thought that was an interesting what it sounds like from the attorney. Um, I just think this is a bit far reaching and would like to have it go back to the drawing board and narrow it down a bit as far as, I mean, it's like half the town is gonna be allowed to place towers with the way I'm seeing the map. So I'd like to see it go back and have it restricted more to industrial areas. I don't, I live at the end of, towards the end of Tenney Lane and I don't, I can't see a, an industrial 150 foot tower at the ball field. I just, it just doesn't belong there. It's not, you know, what this town is. It should be in an industrial zone. So I appreciate your work, and I hope you guys take this back to the drawing board and allow some, some revisions to this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the town council. My name is Barry Hobbins. I'm an attorney from neighboring town of Saco, and I'm here on behalf of Verizon's uh, uh, courteous uh, uh, competition, uh, AT&T Mobility. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, this, wasn't, this issue wasn't initiated by any one company. Uh, I don't think that was the, the, that was the process. I believe the problem with the present ordinance is that the components of the ordinance are 15 years old. 15 years ago, we did not have the technology that we have today. We didn't have the data transfer issues that we have today. We didn't have uh, smartphones as we do today. And what's happened is, is, is that uh, the town of Scarborough is a good example of not looking on a regular basis at certain ordinances. And I have to say, this town really took it upon themselves to do a comprehensive review of this whole area. Obviously, you're going to find differences of opinion when it comes to many issues. Many of those issues are beyond the purview of this community, this governing body, because they are preempted by federal law. That is where, that is where many, of, many of the issues that have been addressed Will, will be involved with. I'm looking at the, this issue as one that this, I think this community has looked at this issue, I've said, I believe spent six to nine months or 10 months, uh, asked, uh, did ask in the process if the carriers had any questions and we provided those, uh, we provided, uh, I think, information that was valuable to the ordinance committee. But I have to tell you, um, that ordinance committee ran the show. It wasn't the carriers that ran the show. It was uh, I, a group of individuals that really took this very seriously, uh, looked at the issue very seriously, and attempted in good faith to try to come up uh, with an area, uh, an area of, of uh, consensus, which is very difficult to do in any, any type of ordinance, especially with the controversy that some of these issues uh, provide individuals who have who are well-meaning and who are sincere in their beliefs. Uh, I hope that we can move forward uh, and not go backward uh, in this process. Uh, I understand that the um, planning board, and I was there at the meeting, there at the public hearing, we're not familiar and we're not educated like the ordinance committee 
was educated and un is not as familiar with the progress that has been made in putting together an ordinance that I think addresses issues such as co-location, uh, scenic, scenic view corridors. All of those issues will be decided by the planning board uh, using pre performance standards. Uh, it's not going to be a rubber stamp to put a, a wireless tower up. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of compromise, and building a consensus, and a lot of alternatives. So I appreciate your, uh, appreciate your work so far, and I urge you to um, use due diligence, go forward, um, but please understand there are constraints that, um, and I would advise strongly that you talk to your legal counsel for the town. And, and get some get some guidance from the town because I think once you do, you will realize that uh, we are we are not misrepresenting the law. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I close the public hearing. This uh, matter will um, go back to the uh, back to the ordinance committee for fine tuning. Um, and just to uh, just a note that every counselor sitting here no, uh, has experienced uh, cell phone problems, and we have uh, this began with um, people in Scarborough uh, relating that to us. So it was not initiated by any cell phone company. So with that being said, no. Well, we that's yeah. I was just saying. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay, so this is not going to be on the second meeting for August 20th. Yes. Okay. Mention. Yes, we'll put it on for. Okay. Yes. Okay, it'll be. Uh, uh, what's the date on August? Will it go, it's going to go to the Ordinance Committee. Correct. Back and it'll be council back for August, August 20th. 20th. Correct. It'll be back August 20th from the Ordinance Committee. Order number 1457 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to designate the RH, RH2, and RF districts in the vicinity of the Holmes Road and Gorham Road. Ian Bacon. <clears throat> Be given a presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this initiative is brought to you by the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, they worked on it for a number of months, and it pertains to um, some pro proposed zoning updates in the Gorham Road area um, in the vicinity of uh, the Nunsudge Golf Course on both sides of the Gorham Road uh, west of the main turnpike as you head uh, past Payne Road out towards North Scarborough. And I'm going to do a quick introduction on this uh, particular order uh, and the next two orders because they're all right. uh, related uh, to the same initiative. Uh, this aerial shows the, the vicinity uh, that the Long Beach Planning Committee was looking at zoning updates. As I mentioned, uh, it's the Nunsuch Golf Course properties, both um, we'll call it the front nine of the golf course on the north side of the Nunsuch River and also um, the southerly uh, back nine portion of the golf course closer to Holmes Road. There's a variety of other properties uh, along Gorham Road, some smaller businesses and homes on the north side of Gorham Road, and then uh, um, a larger parcel north of Gorham Road as you head up towards uh, Running Hill. And this area is recommended for updates in the town's comprehensive plan. And it's really one of the last remaining areas that hasn't been updated since our 2006 uh, comprehensive plan was, uh, was updated. And the zoning uh, initiative since then have uh, been implemented. So this is one of the last areas to, to be looked at by the Long Range Planning Committee. And the goals for the area in terms of the zoning update is, is to ensure the zoning in this area uh, cre creates a transitional gateway uh, 
type area. It, it is already today. Uh, it's a rural to commercial type gateway along the turnpike. Um, the proposed zoning is trying to enable development that's pretty complementary to the golf course, uh, the Nonsuch River and the character of the area, and to enable a mix of both residential, which are allowed today, uh, commercial and senior type housing and mixed use uh, development that capitalizes on this area being close to Payne Road and close to our commercial areas, but also um, very much tied to the rural part of Scarborough west of the main turnpike. This map illustrates the current zoning, and uh, the bright red zoning is um, the town's business two zoning. It's, a, it's strictly commercial um, and business type development that's allowed in this zone. It's sort of the shopping center type uh, zoning that exi is exhibited along Payne Road and Scarborough Gallery. So this zone exists along the turnpike um, for taking up about two thirds of this area and it is right on the edge of the RF district, the Rural and Farming Zone. Um, the Long Range Planning Committee felt that this zoning wouldn't necessarily create that transition from commercial to rural, um, given uh, the uh, interface of kind of rural farming with shopping center type development. So the, the Long Range Planning Committee looked at a, a different type of zone, um, a more mixed use type zone that the town established a few years ago on Running Hill uh, to the north and is proposing that same, those same zoning districts to be extended southward down towards uh, the Nonsuch River to apply to both sides of Gorham Road and to the northerly side of the Nonsuch Golf Course property and the, the other properties in that vicinity. <coughs> South of the Nonsuch River, um, the Long Range Planning Committee is recommending an RF district, um, given that that area is um, pretty much disconnected um, due to the river from the property to the north. And given that um, public utilities are more distant to this uh, particular parcel than they can be to the, um, the Running Hill District area. So in addition to the zoning map uh, changes proposed by the Long Range Planning Committee, um, there also are some zoning amendments um, so that the Running Hill District can apply well to uh, these properties. It's currently geared towards the Running Hill, um, Running Hill Road and the parcels uh, to the north. And the Arch District in this area would allow for more lower impact commercial uses, not the shopping center type development, but office um, and restaurant, smaller retail type uses that could be that transitional area between rural and um, the B2 to the east would allow for a mix of residential type uses that could complement the golf course uh, facility there and be a transition from rural uh, towards the, the commercial area to the east. Um, so the zoning amendments really customize uh, the current RH zone for this to also apply to this area. Um, based on a neighborhood meeting that we conducted in April, um, there were some, also some updates done to the zoning to um, provide for additional buffers to the rural zone to the west because uh, that was one of the concerns that was raised uh, at the neighborhood meeting and the, the committee therefore um, added buffers so that there's, there's more separation between existing development and any new development that may happen in this, this new zone. <coughs> Another component of the updates um, that would apply to the southerly part of the golf course um, is the allowance for the town's conservation subdivision or cluster subdivision provisions to apply to golf courses. This is a tool to enable smaller residential lots in exchange for protected open space. Um, right now, it's geared towards protecting farmland or wetlands. It doesn't allow for golf courses to be the open space that's preserved. So this, um, the amendments that are in your package would enable that. So the golf course and the fairways and the, uh, the wetlands along the golf course could be permanently protected in exchange for enabling some um, residential development to occur along the golf course. This is a image of what a development like that could look like um, from another part of the state. 
So that's what's before you this evening. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a zoning map amendment, which is order 1457, to update the zoning on those three areas uh, in, in, this, in this area, um, to update the zoning ordinance um, so the RH zones can be used for this, um, this new area, and also to update the plumbing ordinance um, to allow for uh, shared leach fields to be used um, in these zoning districts in, in the Gorham Road area. That would enable two family, three family, four family to share a leach field um, rather than having individual systems, which we've allowed in other parts of town. So that's a quick overview, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, would any members of the public like to comment on Order 1457? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. Um, Councilor Holbrook. I actually had um, <clears throat> a couple questions that I want to come back to, but I think I need Dan. Yes. So. <laughs> yep. Um, it appears twice in the language for this, and it has to do with the public sewer service. There's some new language. Um, I'm assuming it's. Um, on page eight of this, it would be item number four, sewer service, last paragraph, and then it reappears again on page 20. I'm assuming that's, you know, same, it's the same yes. language, but it appears under the other zone. Um, so I, I guess I just want to make sure to, of two things, um, that I'm understanding what I'm reading, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is always helpful. Um, for new construction in this zone, we would require them, because there's no sewer lines, to build a septic design and system acceptable to the town. And we would also require them to put a pipe to any future line. But then in addition to that, if at any point in two years that a line is placed, they have to forego their sewer and tie into the sewer line. That's that the correct? That's correct. And what is the average cost of a town approved septic for these types of uses? Um well, I mean, septic systems will range between, you know, seven and twelve thousand dollars in that range for single-family homes. For larger, um, say, a, a small business or a multifamily unit, then you're going to, you know, increase that by fifty percent, uh, okay. depending on the necessary flows for that particular wastewater generation for that particular use. Okay. Um, and uh, this language was added because it, obviously it doesn't exist today in the, mm -hmm. in the Running Hill Zone um, because right now any new development in the Running Hill Zone is required to be served by a sewer. Um, and because that's such a hard and fast rule right now and the town has not extended sewer to this area, this mm -hmm. was the Long Range Planning Committee's um, proposal to provide some amount of development to occur out there, smaller scale development uh, to occur so that, um, you know, single family home, two family home, small business could go in, which wouldn't um, rise to the level for the town to extend sewer, um, but that those smaller developments, once sewer is extended, based on a large development project that, that really um, necessitate sewer and can help fund sewer, uh, then they would need to tie into the sewer system extended by another project or the town. And if I'm also not mistaken, this would be at the cost to the homeowner. When, if, when and if a line were to come through within a two-year period, it is mm -hmm. the burden of the homeowner. They would need to, con yes, they would have to make that connection. I'm going to allow for other comment, but I'm going to have an amendment I would like to offer. But I'll offer some other comments and questions first. Oh, okay. Councilor Katerina. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Long Range Planning Committee, and I'm also a direct abutter <laughs> to the proposed uh, RH2 district on the northern side of, of Gorham Road. Um, 
a lot of my relatives are abutters to this oh. area also. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked to them. The thing that we, as residents in this area, like about this RH is that it allows for transition. Uh, right now it's B2. Um, I know that our, my neighbors, myself, my husband, we would hate to see what's going on in Payne Road and that type of development come up Gorm Road. It's not a very good transition between uh, to the RF uh, when you, it, it's, it's harsh. It's, it would be just too, we just wouldn't want it. Um, so in the neighborhood meeting, as Dan um, pointed out, the concerns of the neighbors were to pr preserve our way of life in the RF, uh, to not have negative impacts from a potential business zone that would allow, you know, greater type of lighting, different type of parking, um, drive through restaurants and all of that to keep it more transitional. Um, and then the buffering, increasing the buffer to 100 feet um, between the RF and the, and the other districts. So the neighbors were uh, very much in, in favor of this uh, as, a, as a real improvement on what's currently there, which is B2. So. Okay. One down the side. I just, oh, Councilor Donovan. Uh, <clears throat> I generally like this. <clears throat> because I think it's a better transitional zone than B2. Uh, B2, as it's reflected on Payne Road, is a very heavily commercial, commercially developed uh, area. And once you cross west on Gorham Road, the character of the land changes mm -hmm. significantly. You really are heading towards uh, a much more rural setting. Uh, and so the running hill zone makes a lot more sense to me because it's it's got mixed uses. Um, I also think that um, uh, uh, this zoning change has less of an effect or impact than uh, it might seem at first blush. Uh, about three quarters or more of it is really revolved around the golf course, which is developed as a golf course. So there really is little left in the way of space. There's a huge amount of wetlands. Mm -hmm. And and north of Gorham Road, which is the new proposed RH2 district, uh, uh, there is, there's a stream running through that and uh, structures that are already in place, houses and small businesses, uh, for most of that stretch. So when you look at what is being rezoned in the RH2 d district from B2 to RH2, there's really very little area there that is available for development. And yet I do, I do think that the uh, RH2 zone much better fits that area than the B2. I, um, I was just going to say I, I felt that I had issues with um, small um, businesses uh, in apartments on um, septic systems. Uh, I, I thought that was, I don't know, I guess if, if um, the uh, planning department uh, seems to think that that can be handled, uh, I think I can be good with that, but I, I'm just going on the record that I feel that there could be water quality issues down the road with that. And uh, with that being said, uh, Councilor Holbrook again. I have one more question, actually, because okay. I just realized something. I'm not sure if maybe it was a typo. So um, on page 13, um, again, kind of last paragraph, it says new lots and then strike out parcels. The division of a parcel that has had five acres or more of an area as of July 16th, 2008 into two or more lots. This is all new language. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't that read today's date, not 2008? So in existence as of now instead of, you know, 2014. I, I'm just wondering if that's a typo. That is using the same date 
uh, for when the Running Hill Zone was originally passed. Um, so it's striking out, if you go to the last part of that paragraph, mm -hmm. it strikes any parcel created after July 16th, 2008. Um, so it's just using the same date as when the zone was created originally. Okay, I did. Um, but it, so it, it's not with a lot of effect. It's not effect. new, new. No. It's just restructuring the paragraph. Okay. Right. I do have my amendment now. Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to offer a motion to remove on both um, page 9 and I believe it's page 20. Um, under the new public sewer service to remove on, on both of those sections the um, item number D which is the owner or developer agrees to connect to the public sewer system within a 20, 24 or months of service being provided in the adjacent street and this requirement is made a condition of approval of any site plan approval for the project um, so we'll, I'll start there so it would be to remove line D on page 9, on the blue, the very top, and then again on page 20. It has to do with the public sewer lines and the requirement. Okay, I need a second first. Second. Okay, discussion. I have a question for Councilor Robert. Mm -hmm. Can you explain more about what, what, where you're coming from? Where that? I'm coming from this is that we are talking about approved septic designs mm -hmm. by not only the state of Maine, mm -hmm. but as well as the town of Scarborough, which is a significant cost to the builder, mm -hmm. especially in a home setting, right. requiring somebody to, after spending that type of money on an approved mm -hmm. piece of equipment that will work, approved by the town, you've been issued an occupancy permit and forcing them to tie into sewer at a later date within a two-year period is a little out, overkill to me, especially where the homeowner may not have the means in a new home, especially if you've you mm -hmm. know, financed for the full value of the home. I think it's a little egregious to me. We have design standards. Either they met them or they haven't. Either we're allowing it or we're not. I, I think it's too much. Okay. So your point is that you haven't really had the opportunity to amortize the cost. You've put all this money into the septic system meets all the standards, and then within two years of sewer arriving, now you're gonna you're, tie into you're, you've got to lose all the, yeah. the benefit of that cost, and yeah. that may be a hardship for some. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Dan, um, the, a question from me that goes with that. Um, sanitary district rules, um, don't they prevail in this if they run... Um, run sewer by um, occupancy. Do you know what the actual There's language requirements is? if your septic system is failing. Okay. Um, and there was requirements for when the sanitary district did its major expansions throughout the community, um, right. you know, back in the 70s mm -hmm. and I think early 80s, um, but primarily the 70s. I don't know exactly the decade. Um, but there was requirements at that time given the, the major capital investment that that organization was making throughout the town, that there right. needed to be a, a uh, connections within a time period. Um, I don't know that it would necessarily apply in this circumstance, but I'd, we would need to check uh, to make sure that their regulations don't, don't apply. But I don't think they would. I thought it was my understanding. You don't believe they would? I don't believe so they would. So if they do conflict, we'd have to come back to this? Well, um, if you strike that language um, mm -hmm. and their standards remain, then um, it you would need to, I don't know that you can amend their bylaws. Right. Uh, like, that counts, that's the Board of Trustees of the Sanitary District. So That's what I'm saying. I don't think that there's any harm in striking this language given your intentions. It may not Matter achieve your goal. Um, what was the reason for having it in there? Well, one of the challenges for this area is that there, is no sewer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there needs to be a substantial development that's proposed to get the town to be comfortable 
investing in sewer extension, yeah. right? So um, if a certain amount of smaller development occurs and uses up a lot of the developable land and is served by septic systems, the more of that occurs, the less compelling economically um, it will be for the town to work to extend sewer. Um, so the intention with this language is to allow a modest amount of development sort of in the interim period of time if it's proposed before a major development is proposed and the town commits to sewer. So, you know, if there's you know, some acreage developed um, at a lower density, it's, it's probably not a, uh, you know, a big deal in the long run. It's more if 50 and 60 or 70 acres is consumed by this lower density development. At some point, it may just not make sense to extend the sewer for in more intense development. Is that bad? It's if the sewer never came across the <laughs> highway? Uh, Depends I, on your perspective. I would say <laughs> yes, it, it is. It, uh, um, I mean, it's, you're still talking about, you know. I've been talking about it for 20 years. Yeah. Dig up the highway. No, it hasn't happened yet. And I just, happen. I don't know. Right. It's, it, it, I think you're heading into uh, an RF zone. Right. It's the... I believe it would be good. It's not bad for the western part of town given that it's a rurally, generally it's a RF zoned area of the community that doesn't need sewer. This corner of um, the west part of town, right next to the main mall, right next to very intense development, Anthem, um, Gannett Drive, Target, etc., cetera, um, and right next to the highway, in f 5, 10, 15 years could have a lot of value from a commercial development standpoint that the town has been thinking about in terms of tax revenue and jobs, etc. So sewer, if extended to a limited area, can enable much more intense commercial development than, than on-site wastewater and therefore could be good in, in that regard. It could be bad in terms of sewer lines extending too far into the western part of town if there's concern about higher density development west of this area. Okay, thank you. Councilor Katarina? Uh, and the other point is down the road, if a developer wants that land that bad wants development, let them pay for the bringing the sewer in. Just if I could, in further response to Councillor Donovan's questions, I, I think the effect of sewer not getting on that side of the turnpike would be that uh, the vision of the uh, Running Hill Zone would really never be realized. Uh, there's fairly significant opportunity for commercial development, particularly yeah. further up the grade, as mm -hmm. you go further up toward Running Hill, uh, where the uses in South Portland and Westbrook are far more conducive and more commercial in nature. And effectively speaking, without sewer, those it would not be possible, though it's allowed through the zone. Right, and also there was another, there was a question that's been asked constantly about trying to uh, link uh, Running Hill Road in with uh, Westbrook or South Portland. Which well, one was it? Well, as part of, yeah, as part in, of that Running Hill area, right. we've looked at uh, partnering with development uh, that may occur to help some of the commuter issues. Right now, Running Hill Road takes the, the massive crush of commuter traffic and was never designed to handle that volume of traffic. A new section of road through an area that supports commercial or mixed uses um, arguably could much better accommodate all that commuter traffic that's working through north and we, uh, northwest Scarborough to points beyond. Right. But working, trying to uh, work with uh, either town on, on a, joining their septic with the Running Hill Road was they didn't show no interest in working with us. So no, the, the likely sewering of that area will occur through from, from the town uh, under the turnpike as right. opposed to from Westbrook or right. South Portland. Yeah, I just want to make that That's clear. Because right. so, people have been asking that. I would be this be a okay. Yep. okay, now... Back to uh, Councilor Holbrook. Um, just to go back and argue my amendment. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, one of the, the 
in the new language, the, the design for the sewage flow of the use will be less than 600 gallons per day. So I'm assuming that limits certain amounts of septic design. So again, I'm going back to my, my target here is that homeowner, that individual mm -hmm. homeowner. Th this is who this will, if it stays, adversely impact. Um, I guess that goes back to my point. If they're commercial, this doesn't even apply in the first place. If you're generating more than that at the 600-gallon yeah. mark, you're going to have to tie into sewer anyway. This doesn't mm -hmm. even need to apply to you at this point. Mm -hmm. No, it would, it would apply to small businesses like retail that are just providing bathrooms for employees and guests. It wouldn't, restaurants would definitely be over. So it, yeah. smaller businesses and then, like you say, um, homeowners, not restaurants or other office buildings that would have Good question. more wastewater generation. Hey, um, Manager Hall would like to yeah, ask just a, a uh, I'd like to ask a question of Dan that may help the council decide on the proposed amendment. I'm not sure if I understood the response to uh, the question asked earlier. So the effect of removing D, uh, if that's no longer there, in the event that the on-lot system that's built today fails, the homeowner is compelled to connect at that point. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Yes. Yeah, my understanding also. I don't know about if there's a sewer line just within the right-of-way, you know, adjacent to the to the property if they would need to connect before failure. I don't think so, but I'd... We, they, they wouldn't by virtue of town ordinance. What we don't know is whether the sanitary district Correct. has other regulation in that Correct. regard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anyone down here? Any questions, comments? Anyone else? Yep. Uh, no, I guess not. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, if that's it, all those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? Bill's for it. Okay, okay no one pardon. opposed. Oh, Bill's for it? Yes. Oh, okay, bigger pardon. Yeah. Amendment carries. Uh, now on to the main motion. Okay. Discussion on the main motion. Sure. <laughs> okay. I'll go again. Sure. Um, you know, I think I was probably, the, you know, I brought this up at the last meeting. I guess I don't care enough anymore. <laughs> um, I was a little worried about the RF being zoned that when we just changed to light industrial. Um, I, I did take the time to go over the bridge and take a look at that parcel. It is extremely wet, it's a gully, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm not sure how far back that goes. Irregardless, I highly doubt with some heavy, unless you had some heavy duty DEP permits, you'd be doing much of anything there anyway. So um, I guess I have a little less question about how that would fit. So um, other than that, you know, happy to support it and hopefully we get some new development rolling and Hopefully, small businesses can be prosperous up through there. So, okay, that's. Uh, I did provide a map of the wetlands just in case you. Oh, okay. All right, on the main motion. All those in favor. Opposed. Is the 7 p.m. public hearing and second meeting on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405 is Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance to make updates to the RH, the RH2, and the RH2 districts and the Conservation Subdivision Design Standards. Hey, Dan, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> public hearing. Anyone from the public would like to speak on the <clears throat> Design, subdivision design standards, 1458. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Council Holbrook, you must have some. Got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing for you. It's a good thing. Uh, just that I'm happy to see things kind of roll, roll back a little bit. This is. 
Um, some, some good news that, you know, a duplex could, you know, share, especially with the technology they have to design yeah. some of these systems. It's you know, amazing. So mm -hmm. glad to see we can do something to help construction a little bit. All right. Nothing down the sun. Okay. All right. With that, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1459 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 404A, the Town of Scarborough Plumbing Ordinance. Dan, do you have anything there? I think uh, Councillor Holbrook just spoke to that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone from the public like to speak on Order 1459? Seeing none, I close the hearing. Okay, motion on the floor. So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1465 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the following new request for a food handler's license. KBC 14 LLC doing business as Max Deli located at 426 U.S. Route 1, Suite 2. Robert E. Anderson doing business as the paper store located at 11 Hennepin Drive. And North Madison Hill LLC doing business as the Great East Butcher Company located at 450 Payne Road. I would just note that the suggestion of the town clerk, uh, these licenses have been packaged uh, all together, so one public hearing will suffice uh, and one action of council will suffice. Okay. All, all the businesses are in compliance? Yes. Yes, they are. Okay. Fine. Right. Anyone from the public would like to speak on Order 15, uh, 14, 1465? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Oh, that's right. I thought it was just a public hearing. It's actually action, I'm sorry. Action. Okay. Action. Yeah. Okay. okay. We have a motion and a second. Discussion. Seeing no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed. Under old business order number 1454 is a second reading on the proposed changes to chapter 601, the town of Scarborough traffic ordinance. I can give a very quick introduction, or would you like to? Do you want me to do it, or you do it? It's up to you. Please no, go no, ahead. No, Tom, please. Thank you. Well, quite... Quite simply, uh, this is a matter that has come through the Ordinance Committee, actually uh, is about a year old, mm -hmm. uh, and it took a while just to, f uh, frankly, get up on their agenda. Uh, I believe all of these changes uh, began at the Police Department, and they're proposed really to clean up the ordinance and to align our local ordinance with state law, and in, in, in those cases where we can, we rely on state law standards. Uh, the, the one issue uh, that did get some discussion at the Ordinance Committee was, but was not part of this package, uh, which I expect they'll revisit, had to do with parking on the lower end of Pine Point Road. So that's not part of that. There's no changes proposed, but I think that's a matter uh, for future discussion among uh, the committee members. So uh, we certainly recommend your support. Okay, would anybody, any member of the public like to speak on the traffic ordinance? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Councilor Holbrook. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, I, I do have two things. Um, the first one I, I did want to point out is, um, I'm sorry, Toadie, I think there's a typo. Um, and I know this one's an actual typo. <laughs> um, page, if I can go down here a little bit. Um, there was... Page 9, I believe. Yes, Section 25, Pedestrian Rights and Duties, has actually been struck out where it should be remaining and then renumbered accordingly because pedestrian C, if you go down to page 10, C is remaining. Um, F has a section that remains in G, so instead of that, it should be A, B, C, and Section 25. Well, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, the one other thing, um, and I do have an amendment, so um, that would be on page four, and that is frightening animals. And I did take a moment to speak with the um, 
to communicate via email with the police officer that had recommended some of these changes to ordinance. And um, I had communicated with him because the, um, and, and he did, uh, and I meant to share that, and I'm terribly sorry, I forgot to email it to everyone. Um, he did agree that the town's um, current language, which would be section 10, is um, certainly more protective and is better, and it has better wording than the state's. And that's what this is, most of this is doing. It's cleaning up town language and getting rid of it because there are state laws. But he did feel that I was correct in that. And what this would do is it, it offers a better protection the way we have it worded. Right. Um, so the, the two main differences really being, um, and, and just for the benefit of the public, this is frightening animals. So um, the driver of any motor vehicle approaching a person riding, driving, or leading an animal shall use reasonable caution in passing said animals. If said person so signals, a driver shall bring his motor vehicle to a stop and remain stationary as long as it may be necessary to allow said animals. Um, the difference between ours and the state is that the state only addresses if you are traveling in the same side of the road. Right of that person driving or riding. So we're talking about horseback riding, we're talking about buggy, not that we have a lot of buggies, but, but there is certainly, especially around me, yes. been a resurgence of horses. I have a lot of new neighbors, they are out riding, they're picking up the trail systems. Um, so again, what the difference is between ours is, ours protects drivers, riders, and whatever that's with um, an animal, a person with an animal, no matter which direction. So if you're coming onto them or, you know, from the opposite direction or vice versa, you're coming. Can, can we have an amendment? Can I make a motion to keep Section 10, Frightening Animals? I was talking about the different amendment. Can you, uh, do, do I have a second? Did you, wait, I, oh. didn't, I didn't hear her motion. He's flagging me. Um, I would like to make a motion to retain Section 10, Frightening Animals. On page four. I got it. I got it. Okay. He wants my motion because I'm rambling. Do I? I need a I second. A second. Yeah, because we've got to have a motion to discuss. I will second you. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so this is, like I said, the difference is is that the our the way ours is written, the protection is no matter what side the person is on with the animal, mm -hmm. whether it's the lane you're traveling in or the opposite lane, you're to use due caution and pass, you know, accordingly. Um, the state law only references, and I quote, um, when traveling in the same direction as an animal on a way. Right. So this just allows you use exercise caution no matter which way, and you're not maliciously or purposely trying to fighten the animal as to cause injury to the rider. Okay. okay. Did, you, did you get the, the wording on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just keeping it. Okay. Okay. All right, so we've got an amendment, a second, discussion. Do you want to have any discussion on the amendment? Okay, all those in favor? Yeah. Opposed? I see none. Okay, back to the main motion as amended. Discussion. I would just say that this was like... I'm just probably repeating um, what Tom and Jessica said, but um, it was just a clean up. It, we needed to change a lot of warning so that we were in compliance with a lot of state um, laws. Uh, and I will say the police department did a phenomenal job. It was a huge task to take on. Um, and they did a great job of making it very clear, um, concise. It was presented well, so I, I see no issues with it, and I hope that we can move past this. Okay, anyone else? I just want to point out a, a point of clarification. Tody and I were a bit confused. I believe the amendment that just passed was offered by Councilor Hobrook and, and actually passed in first reading. So It did. I never offered it. It was a public hearing, so I never offered it. Well, it was it's it was passed at first reading, and I believe it, it was successful because the version in your packet uh, does not propose that language to be stricken. I thought I was just having deja vu. That's all. Mm -hmm. I have it in my packet. Mine is. Yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm referencing that section 25. 
Um, she says it was in error, but that was actually what was recommended by the police officer. Uh, okay. No, it's, this is frightening animals? No, no. This is to do with pedestrian rights and duties. Yeah, mine's struck. Right? Either way, I'm sorry, mine both uh, has both both anyway. I can't see what you're looking at. I'm sorry. We're good anyway. Okay. Right. <laughs> we're good. Either, either we're way, good. We're, we're good. We're good. All right. Yeah. If you think we're good, yeah. I'll trust you. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Sorry to cause alarm. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> okay, so where are we now? <laughs> so we're going to vote for the main motion. Yep. Right. Okay. Back to the main motion with the amendment. There was no further discussion. Um, so all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1466 is act on the names posted to the Senior Advisory Board at the June 18, 2014 Town Council meeting as recommended by the Appointments Committee. And those names were Philip Christie, Troy Hendrickson, and Susan Wilder. Okay, this, <clears throat> we don't have any public comment on that. We do. Okay. All right, uh, would anybody from the public like to comment, comment on Order 1466? Seeing none, I close the hearing, and do I have a motion? Move yes. approval. Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Under new business order number 1467, <coughs> the first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the Scarborough zoning ordinance by adding an affordable housing in lieu, in lieu fee to the zoning districts that allow residential density bonuses. I believe Dan's been sticking around just to <laughs> say, um, to give you 30 seconds of overview. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, really a follow up to the efforts of the Housing Alliance um, last fall. Uh, the Housing Alliance worked hard with the Long Range Planning Committee, established another kind of tool in the toolbox for trying to uh, generate revenue for affordable housing um, creation in town. And this proposal would add to the other zoning districts in town, the other residential and mixed use zones that allow for density bonuses to add um, the affordable housing in lieu fee density bonus. And that's a mechanism where a development project can have a bit more residential density if they pay uh, $20,000 per additional unit and that $20,000 goes into an account. I think the manager referred to this account earlier mm -hmm. at your workshop um, that then can collect some fees and then be used to um, help design, construct, promote affordable housing in the community. So um, this is isn't a new idea, it's just extending this, that idea from the fall to the other zones where bonuses are already provided for. Okay. Um, would any members of the public like to speak to this order 1467? Seeing none, we have a motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. <laughs> Councilor Holbrook. Um, so I just did want to, for the benefit of the folks at home, to go over um, one other item. So um, this is not creating, um, you know, an in lieu fee anywhere other than, like it was stated, that where density bonus is already allowed. So you're not going to find this in RF districts. You're not going to, you know, this is planned high development areas, growth areas within the town. Um, the one other thing I did want to touch on, and I, I think perhaps Dan could explain it a little bit better than I can, is, is you cannot do all in lieu fees. There, there is a, some thresholds okay. that there's some, um, you can do some of maybe a development transfer, you could do some in lieu fee, but there is a dynamic that, you know, you're not just maxing out all in lieu fees. Yeah, and it actually kind of varies based on the zoning district yeah. you're in, but that's correct. Yeah. Um, in some zones, you can do an in lieu fee, but you also may need to do a development transfer fee or actually transfer development rights from the rural area to the higher development zones that Councillor Holbuck was referring to. So, um, but it's kind of, it depends on the, the district. 
Dan, are there any districts that they could pay all in lieu fees? Um, I believe so. I don't have all the districts. That's no, okay. In my packet, um, but yes, I this is so. just the uh, first yeah. reading, so. Yeah, I can uh, get you a breakdown for your public right. hearing and second reading. Right, because I meant here's the issue that. Um, Council Holbrook and I have spoke to many times. If we keep doing in lieu fees and the housing market continues to get better and the sways towards um, larger, um, more expensive homes, mm -hmm. then those we're going to be getting the in, in lieu fees, but we're not going to get any affordable homes being built. I met people have called them workforce housing, but I like the affordable homes. So that, that's a goal. I think it's been a goal of this council for a few years now to try to get in. It's, we're, it's, we're not getting much traction on it. And I think at some point we need to gain some traction on getting, getting some affordable homes in, in the community Absolutely. Um, that, um, you know, uh, teachers and um, nurses and, you know, people with middle incomes can afford. Uh, they're becoming pretty scarce to find in the town. So that, that's my only concern within low fees, and it has been for a while now. So as long as we manage them properly, I think we're good. I, I'm not against this at all, by any means. Um, okay, any, anyone else? Down the set? Any? Sure. Boy, it's quiet down there tonight. <laughs> okay, with that being said, all those in favor? Opposed? Order number 1468 is act on the request to approve the turf law settlement agreement, authorize the town manager to execute it on behalf of the town, and grant the 2011 and 2012 abatements. Okay, public comment. Would anyone like to comment on this? 1468, seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, council discussion. Would you like to, anything to add to it? Uh, I can describe it if you think that'd be helpful, or it's yes. already been moved. All right, no, I don't guess not. So, um, any discussion? <clears> okay, <throat> hey, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1469 is act on the request to appoint Council Jim Marie Katarina to MMA's Legislative Policy Committee and to authorize the town manager to sign the nomination papers. Any members of the public like to speak to order number 1469? Seeing none, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion. Thank you, Jean. Yes, no, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. She's I offer myself. <laughs> a, job, a job that... Uh, She's the perfect person for the job. It's going to take some on this time. Council. A lot of time. And I appreciate it, and I thank you very much for stepping up to the plate. <clears throat> Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1470 is act to authorize the town manager and after consultation with the council chair to sign future council nomination... Um, an appointment papers for outside committees and boards like the MMA, PACs, and GPCOG, etc. Okay. Overview from the town. Yes. Um, I assure you my intent is not a, a grab at power here. It's really to simplify and streamline your agenda. There are, um, every year there are multiple um, sorts of appointments to outside committees. This would not apply to any internal committees. That's certainly council's rights to do. Um, but this would enable me to work uh, with the members of council, identify folks that are willing to serve in certain capacities to outside groups, and be able to make those appointments on behalf of the council. Again, just to streamline your process. I, of course, would never do that without the consent of the council member uh, and without the involvement of the council chair. Okay, there was one other thing that you uh, had mentioned to me in passing is that um, a lot of these organizations um, want uh, council approval. Mm -hmm. They do, yes. And um, by us doing this, this will streamline it. So if we need to appoint somebody to a uh, 
something that's coming up right off and we don't have a council meeting like in the summertime mm -hmm. um, the the chair and in the um, counselor and the uh, town manager can meet and just do it and uh, the manager would have the authority to say yeah, I have the authority to do this through the council to um, whatever organization it may be did That's I right. In fact, that? I've already nominated uh, Jean Marie twice. They didn't take that. They said, I need a council action. So, um, <laughs> so this is where that came up. This is where that all came from. Uh, okay. Anyone from the public like to comment on this issue? 1470. Seeing none. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Oh, everyone's all set. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Okay. Non-action items. There are none. Standing and special committee reports. I will start with Councilor St. Clair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. I just have one. Um, I just wanted to report in about um, the dogs group. We've been Plover, the Plover group. Um, we've been working. Um, we meet every other Tuesday. It's open to the public, so anyone can come. Um, it's a good group. It's a hardworking group. I'm actually really, um, I don't want to say the word surprised, but happy to see um, some of the things that are coming out of this. Um, and I think uh, they're going to be able to put together a pretty good presentation for the council um, for you all to review. Um, and that's it. Uh, council Blaze. Uh, I'd just like to mention the fact that Bud Hansen, who is the chairman of the Senior Advisory Board, was presented an award at Scarborough Terrace mm -hmm. as the outstanding volunteer of the year, uh, not only for his work at Scarborough Terrace, but for his work at the Maine Veterans Home and here in town, of course, being chairman of the Senior Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. In addition, the uh, Town Community Services Organization received an award for uh, outstanding work as a senior organization mm -hmm. for the town. And Hallie Hodge, uh, who is the uh, senior programs coordinator, uh, accepted the award for the town. So, that's, great. that's all I've got. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Katarina. Um, yeah, the Conservation Commission didn't meet this month, so I don't have anything to report on that. And then long-term planning, um, probably the major thing we've started working on that will be of interest to a lot of people is we are uh, exploring how we can do some different types of zoning at Higgins Beach and Pine Point areas, since these are a lot of non so-called non-conforming lots and make it easier for homeowners and for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, to be dealing uh, with with um, what people would like to do down in those areas. So we're in the beginning stages of looking at that and exploring it, and we're going to do a bus trip at some <coughs> point and whatever, but I'll keep you all posted. I'll let you fill in. Ed, no one, we're coming to the neighborhood, okay? Ed? Hmm? I said, well, I'll let you know we're coming to the neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Okay, okay. Councilor Donovan. I know committees uh, did not meet, uh, so nothing to report. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, Housing Alliance will be meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30, and um, I'm sure they will have a lot to discuss after tonight. <laughs> yes. So, um, And then outside of that, that, that's it for tonight. Okay. Um, the one thing that I, um, I, I I think I uh, was forgot to mention the ordinance committee is August 13th. We meet and um, 
that we'd be taking up the cell phone towers again. Um, oh, shoot, I forgot what else there was. Yeah, there was. The only other item on the agenda, as I recall, is medical marijuana. Um, kind of, there's two components. To, uh, I have something to add to it, too, that I was going to talk to you about. Oh, great. So right, I there, guess the agenda is still in formation. Right, it is. There's a couple other things. I believe there was, uh, at some point, they're going to be talking about parking on Pine Point Road again. Yeah, but I think we have, I think we have, we'll, we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention to the public that we had that. And with that, um, we will go to the manager's report. Oh, thank you. Just a couple of quick updates on uh, town projects that we're involved with. Pleasant Hill Road, uh, that's a full reconstruction project uh, that's fully underway. Everything's going as scheduled. We appreciate the residents' patience, um, though the contractor's doing a great job of maintaining two lanes of traffic. Uh, so th things are, are going well with that project. Uh, the pedestrian improvements down here at Gorham Road, that's where Wentworth Drive and Hannaford Drive intersect Gorham Road, will be done as part of, uh, in time for the school. So the, the contract's been awarded to Dearborn Construction. And I expect you'll see uh, work underway within the next couple of weeks. Again, it will it needs to be complete before school uh, lets back in. Uh, the last piece of news is the Oak Hill pedestrian improvements. The council may recall there's a host of smaller improvements affecting the Oak Hill intersection. Uh, staff is really stretched too thin to expect that we can do that this fall. Uh, and frankly, I think we'll benefit from taking a couple of those recommendations back to the transportation committee, fine tuning them further and we expect to do that work in the spring. So um, I think residents may appreciate there's a bit of construction fatigue that uh, a little layoff in Oak Hill is not a bad thing. I've been working with a, a local group, uh, Friends of Scarborough Hockey. They're interested in possibly developing an ice rink uh, on town-owned land here on the municipal campus. Uh, there's a memorandum of understanding that is in formation and should I be successful in getting that to the point that it's worthy of the full council's attention, it may be on your agenda uh, in August. Um, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat related to that, we're also working with Port Portland Water Company regarding the old tower site, which is next to the high school here. Uh, that site no longer serves a purpose for the water company, and they've approached the town regarding their interest and need to acquire or obtain an easement through the campus for them to develop a new uh, water main at some point in the future and the conversation has been to switch um, swap the site in exchange for the easement again bless you thank you uh, that may be ready uh, to come to council as soon as next month as well uh, and I would just remind the council and those at home the council's still in its summer meeting schedule so the next meeting of council is August 20 uh, there's only one meeting next month with that I'm available for questions Any questions? Okay, no questions. Uh, council member comments. I'll start right back with Councillor St. Clair. Um, I don't have any. Councillor Blaise. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Katarina, well, I know I you have yes. some. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, I just um, wanted to let the public know I'm glad showed up for the public hearing today on the South Towers. I think it's important for, for folks to express their concerns about, you know, what we're doing. Uh, and I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, I, I do support, we, we need to improve cell service. I'm one of the people who's affected by it and, and would like to see some improvements on it myself, uh, particularly for my business, uh, but it's also a public safety issue. However, um, I agree we do need to be reasonable about placement of the towers, and I look forward to working, you know, with ordinance. And I'd, I'd like to hear from the planning board members, too, more about the so-called tools they've talked about that will help them uh, zone, 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 that's a bad word, zone in on um, where towers should be and what makes the best sense. So that doesn't cause... Um, a diminution of value, property values, as a realtor, I'm very well aware of that, or uh, cause uh, concerns about health effects. So, <coughs> here I am with that. I just wanted to let people know. Thank you. Councillor Donovan. Uh, on the cell tower issue, uh, I'm 
Uh, just a couple of comments. I'm really glad it's going back to ordinance. Uh, as much as it's been worked through uh, at several levels, I think the, the public needs to know more about it. Uh, I think uh, members of the council who really haven't been up to speed, like myself, uh, need to do a lot more homework, uh, get involved, attend the ordinance committee meetings, have a discussion, start to do some analysis of, of what our options are. Uh, while I do support improved cell phone coverage, I think that we are moving in that direction as a society where it's becoming more and more important. Uh, I think that the issues here are a big deal. The health issues, and the health issues create such a problem because there's such an uncertainty as to, uh, as to whether it's uh, a potentially long-term serious problem or not. And, and so it, uh, it, and none of us want to be put ourselves in a position of, of making that kind of fatal mistake of, of putting it in, in a place that years from now turns out to have been uh, harmful. Uh, and while that's sort of an uncertain status, there's no question about the property value issue uh, that, I mean, you really have to be respectful mm. of the fact that people in residential settings have bought their properties, have lived there, and they're comfortable in that. And, and the same for sc scenic uh, settings. Uh, it's, it's the trademark of, uh, of uh, Scarborough, and it's why the community more and more uh, is highly regarded uh, far and wide. So I, I think that's, uh, those are important. I'm glad we're going to take as much time as necessary to do it right, because I do think we can do it right, but it's going to take some work. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to comment was we're, we're two months into having a Plover coordinator, and uh, I've gotten to know Ryan uh, Wynn pretty well. Uh, I like this guy. Uh, he, this is a guy with an advanced degree. We pay him almost nothing. We ask him to work <laughs> more hours <laughs> than so in, in, in a demanding setting where there's no there's no precedent. There's no prior uh, prior established procedures for how to how to act. And uh, he knocked off uh, uh, educational materials that are first rate. Uh, when we learned more about what sort of signage requirements we needed, he was quick to get on it. Uh, and get those out into the field because nothing ever goes quite the way you hope. And we thought that uh, there would be very little in the way of plover uh, activity at the southern end of Pine Point. And there's a huge amount of plover activity at the at southern end of Pine Point and northern end of Old Orchard Beach. Uh, and so uh, that's, uh, I've really thought that uh, he should be recognized. Uh, we've come a long way uh, with educational materials. Uh, signage. Uh, he set up an effective monitoring program, and from I, I've talked to many, many people uh, on the beach at Higgins, uh, and it's uh, overwhelmingly uh, supporting the new ordinance and the uh, and the efforts by uh, the people who are making an effort to make it work, uh, with uh, the leadership really coming from uh, Ryan and uh, Tom Hall. So I wanted them to be recognized for for the contribution to make this so far so good. And we'll, hopefully we'll have a very successful remainder of our summer. Thank you. Council Holbrook. Um, so I just have two things. The first one being, I'll, I'll touch on the, where I'm kind of currently thinking on the cell towers. Certainly um, I, I was one of, the, one of the people doing the happy dance when I heard the ordinance committee <laughs> was doing something about it. I have the unfortunate displeasure of living west of the Turnpike, which if you saw by that map, 90% of it gets no signal. Um, so yeah, you know, if I run into that, especially, you know, you, you're driving along, there's no signal. You're lucky if you have signal in your house. You're lucky if you have signal on the road. And heaven forbid something happens to you, because you're out in the middle of the woods with no pay phones for miles. So it, it certainly was, was good news to hear. Um, I am supportive of it going back. You know, I'm glad to hear that it's going back to ordinance. I think it still needs some tweaking. Um, you know, there's some things we could probably do that, that would make a lot of folks, you know, more comfortable, more happy. Um, I do have or feel it's it's one of those, that it's the day and age you live in, those necessary evils that, that kind of, you know, the times change. Um, 
On the flip side of that, for as long as I've lived, lived in my house for longer than I want to admit to, um, which is most of my life, and that would give away my age. But, um, you know, for, for my entire memory, there is a tower on Squato Hill. It has been there for as long as I can remember, and I have to tell you, it's been there so long, it's just part of the landscape to me. I, I don't look over there and see a tower anymore. It's become just part of the view that you see, and you become accustomed to it. So I, I think, you know, there's a will, there's a way. We could do this to make people reasonably happy, maybe push up the setback some more. Um, you know, be a little more careful about the placement and those sorts of things. But, but there is a huge significant problem for a good chunk of this community. Um, so my other thing is I just wanted to remind folks we are still, I know it's being, you know, well, it's raining today, but we had had some beautiful weather, weather recently, and I know it's hard to think about things like um, heating oil and those sorts of things, those are horrible <laughs> words, but um, we are still... I'm trying to do the clink bags, so I just wanted to let folks know there are still bags available. Um, the clink bags raise money for the town's fuel assistance program. Um, so if you're interested, you can always swing through and pick up a bag and, and drop it off at the clink box up at uh, Hannaford. So um, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, my comments would be uh, to basically tonight to the cell phone towers. Um, we. They are general overlays of areas that needed cell phone coverage. And uh, when it goes back, we'll go back to the Ordinance Committee and uh, fine tune those areas. Um, and we had plenty of input in the last week from emails and, um, and tonight. So, we, you know, we've got a lot to go on. We, um, they probably, they definitely can go in other areas. Uh, you always said right from the beginning the, the uh, choice of uh, making it uh, town owned property um, first, um, I knew was going to be an issue right from the get go. And I said, you know, uh, there's plenty of uh, private property that would conceal these towers and be away from neighborhoods that uh, possibly um, would be just as suited for um, the carriers to be on. So, um, and I, I've researched it pretty good, and there, there's areas that I meant um, not all vistas are going to be protected, um, but I think uh, generally a lot of people um, would be happy with the placement of them. So, um, and like I said, this whole process began with people mentioning, you know, when is Scarborough going to work towards getting better cell phone coverage and I think everyone's like I said everyone sitting here uh, knows the coverage in Scarborough and uh, it needs some work so with that being said um, I go for a motion to adjourn so moved yeah. second all those in favor aye